A lot of people have been saying that when it comes to Mad Lads, I've been pretty biased. And everyone keeps asking, where are the Mad Lassies? And they're right. They're absolutely right. I have a bunch of Mad Lassies in my infamous list, but I just haven't done them yet. Well, today, that changes. In World War II, a lot of soldiers were killed. And a lot of wives received that dreaded letter from the army. A lot of women grieved and mourned the loss of their husbands, but one woman loved her husband so much that she didn't grieve and mourn. She snapped, and she decided that she wasn't going to take this lying down. She was going to get revenge. Maria Otiabriskaya. But before we get into the mad lad, this video was brought to you by Raycon. Raycon is revolutionising the tech industry by providing you with state-of-the-art earbuds at half the price of other premium brands. They are endorsed by celebrities such as Snoop Dogg, Mike Tyson and Rich the Kid. I'll be using my Raycons for the long hours I'll be working out in the garden. Raycon gives you 6 hours of playback, seamless Bluetooth pairing, and more bass in a compact and customizable design in a range of colours and patterns. Raycon earbuds fit a variety of sizes and have no dangling wires or stems, and if you are not completely satisfied, also a 45 day free returns policy. So get yourself a pair of Raycons by clicking my link in the description box down below, buyraycon.com slash Dankula to get 15% off your order. Before we get into the video, in case any of you are wondering why things look a, a little bit different behind me, I am currently in the process of uh, creating a studio. I've, I've rented a place and I am turning it into a recording studio in order to make videos for this channel. And uh, this, this set's only temporary. This is actually the set for the second channel videos, uh, the main set where I will be making my Mad Lads and other big videos, it's, it's not finished yet. I'm, st I'm still building it. Hopefully it'll be done soon, hopefully, but in the meantime we're just going to use this as a temporary set. That's why I haven't uploaded in almost a month now, so if all of you could do me a massive favour, uh, the, the algorithm kind of, uh, the algorithm just kind of like, no, no lube, just <clears throat> because because I've not uploaded. So if all of you could do me a huge favour and if you could slap slap a like on this video that you, that you haven't even watched yet, I know it's cringe to ask people to do that, but sadly, it works. And if you could also subscribe as well. And if you could also uh, check out things like my Patreon or my subscribe star. Um, they're not required, they're not, they're not necessary for you to do that at all, but I will be very grateful if you do. But if things work out with this studio, if things actually go very well, then we'll be putting out about five or six videos every month on the main channel and two videos a day on the second channel. Just con content, 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 content. That's that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, and we're already on track for uh, five videos for next month. One of them is, uh, well, three of them are mad lads and one of them is uh, a mad lad that you've asked for a lot. It's not Varg. Shut up about Varg. But anyway, thank thank you for your for your patience. Please slap a like on this video, and now we can actually get into the mad lad. Maria Vasilyevna Otyabriskaya was born on the 16th of August 1905 into a Ukrainian peasant family as one of ten children, and she was born in Kiev, a village in the Torrid Governorate of the Crimean Peninsula. Being of a higher peasantry class known as Kulak, a term coined to refer to peasants with over eight acres of land, her family couldn't exactly live in abundance, but they were shielded from poverty. Maria left the family farm to spend most of her childhood and youth in Sevastopol, and after completing her sixth grade schooling in Zankoy, Maria moved to Simferopol, where she worked at a cannery and later got a job as a telephone operator at the city telephone exchange. 
During her time in Simferopol, Maria met a cavalry cadet named Ilya Fedotovich Ryadnenko, whom she later married in 1925. The newlywed couple decided to change their surname to Oktyabrskaya, which means October, in honour of the October Revolution. Because you had to be supportive of the revolution back then. Because we all know what happened if you weren't. In the late 1920s to early 1930s, Maria's family found themselves under suspicion of resistance against the Russian Revolution. In 1928, Joseph Stalin implemented a collectivization policy known as the First Five-Year Plan, with the goal to redistribute the food supply and means of production by integrating private land holdings into collective state-controlled farms. And as we all know, that went absolutely horrendously. To facilitate this economic shift, the Soviet government portrayed kulaks as class enemies of the USSR. The term kulak became a reference to property ownership among peasants who were deemed hesitant to join the revolution. As a result, millions of kulaks were arrested, deported or executed. Because communism. Maria's family was then deported in the early 1930s to the Urals, where they settled in Bayanovka, a village in the Sverdlovsk... Sverdlovsk Oblast. Russian names, man. Just, just assume that I said it correctly. Maria, however, was not required to make this journey as she was married to a non-Kulak. In the summer of 1940, her husband Ilya was appointed as Commissar of the 134th Howitzer Artillery Regiment and he was ordered to be transferred to Kishinev, the capital of Moldova. Growing fascinated with her husband's line of work in the military, Maria became involved in the Military Wives Council where she acquired training as an army nurse and also learned to operate firearms and vehicles. Maria even mastered shooting with a machine gun, and she has been quoted as saying, marry a serviceman and you serve in the army. An officer's wife is not only a proud woman, but also a responsible title. On the 22nd of June, 1941, Hitler ordered the initiation of Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of Russia, with the goal to increase German territory and to destroy communism. This invasion involved 3.8 million German personnel, 3,350 tanks, 2,770 planes and 7,200 artillery pieces, making it one of the largest invasions in human history. And they still fucked it up. Hitler had originally made a pact with Stalin to keep the Soviet Union out of the war, Although this pact pulled the Soviets into a false sense of security, they nonetheless prepared themselves for an invasion. Yet, when it came to the 22nd of June, the Soviets were still taken by surprise. This invasion was later coined by the Soviets as the start of the Great Patriotic War. Maria was evacuated to Tomsk in Siberia, along with her sister, other relatives and other military wives and there she resumed her occupation as a telephone operator in a military school. It wasn't until 1943, after nearly two years without any news from her husband on the front line, that she receives an official letter with the following message. Your husband, Regimental Commissar Ilya Oktyabrskaya, died a brave man's death on the 9th of August, 1941, in one of the battles in Ukraine. Ilya, who had been transferred to the 206th Rifle Division, had been killed by a machine gun blast while leading a charge against German forces near Kiev. Upon hearing this news, Maria was just absolutely devastated. This news just completely broke her. I mean... Imagine how that must feel, constantly worrying about your husband and writing him letters every day and telling him how much you love him and telling him how you can't wait for him to come home to you, just to find out that not only is he already dead, 
but he died a whole two years ago and you had no idea. Maria wasn't just sad. She was furious. She erupted into an anger, the likes of which the world has rarely seen. And so, she filed an appeal to the local military enlistment office, demanding to be sent to the front. But it was rejected for two strong reasons. Maria was already 38 years old at the time, making her too old to serve, and she also suffered from a long-standing condition called spinal tuberculosis, making her unfit for active duty. Still, Maria did not give up. Hello there. The camera broke, so we need to film this part again. During this time, the country was raising funds for its military, and Maria had an idea. An idea that would allow her to serve and avenge her husband, while also making her spinal tuberculosis a non-issue. She was going to buy a tank. Although it was not uncommon for citizens to donate towards war production in the Soviet Union, those making the donations were usually men. But Maria and her sister sold all of whatever possessions they could gather and worked for several months as embroiderers to amass a total of 50,000 rubles to purchase a T-34 model 1941 medium tank. A remarkable figure considering that the average salary at the time was only 200 rubles. Maria then donated the tank to the Red Army. But this donation came with a few conditions. Via a telegram to the Kremlin addressed to Joseph Stalin himself, Maria said this. Dear Joseph Vissarionovich, In battles for the homeland, my husband was killed. The regimental commissar Otyabriskaya Ilya Fedotovich. For his death, for the death of Soviet people tortured by the fascist barbarians, I want to take revenge on the fascist dogs, for which I contributed all of my personal savings to the state bank to build the tank. 50,000 rubles. I ask you to name the tank Fighting Girlfriend and send me to the front as the driver of this tank. I have the speciality of a chauffeur, I have excellent command of a machine gun, and I am a Voroshilov shooter. Signed, Maria Otyabriskaya. Maria outlined two conditions. One, that the tank be named Fighting Girlfriend. And two, that she be assigned as the driver of the tank. Maria soon received a response from Stalin himself, which read, Aye, fuck it. Why not? Of course, I'm paraphrasing just a little. The State Defence Committee advised Stalin that the move could have a positive effect as a morale booster on both the desperate population and the troops. Soon after the donation, Maria began a five-month training programme in May of 1943 at the Omsk Tank School in order to master the skills of operating a T-34 tank. This was rather uncommon as tank crews received a much shorter amount of time for training as they were needed almost immediately on the front and very often tanks would even go into combat unpainted. However, the Soviet government did not want to send Maria into battle untrained. They wanted to make sure that she would be effective. After all, the morale boost would kind of backfire if they sent her to the front and she just immediately died. After completing her training, in September of 1943, Maria was posted to the 2nd Battalion of the 26th Brigade of the 2nd Tank Corps, of the Soviet Guard as a tank driver and mechanic. She shared a cabin with Commander Pyotr Chibotko, Gunner Gennady Yasko and radio operator Mikhail Galkin. I don't know if I said those names correctly. Tough shit. The emblazoned fighting girlfriend on the turret of the T-34. 
the presence of women fighting in combat alongside men was kind of rare, albeit not too uncommon. As a result, Maria and her crew were subject to ridicule, as many of the other tank commanders saw Maria as a publicity stunt and a bit of a joke. But this attitude quickly changed as Maria gave the following speech at a front rally. I swear to you that the crew of the fighting girlfriend will not leave you. I will smash the fascists while my heart is beating. And then Maria and the rest of the tank battalion headed to the front line. And fortunately, we have actual footage of this. Uh, Dank. Mm -hmm. The uh, Girls and Panzer video got copyright claimed. During her first battle on the 21st of October in Smolensk, Maria showed extraordinary manoeuvring skills and assisted in neutralising machine gun nests and artillery positions, all while under heavy fire. The tank was halted due to severe damage to the tracks, so Maria rushed out of the turret to conduct repairs to the outside of the tank while still under intense fire, disobeying a lot of orders in the process. Her crew tried to stop her in fear that she would be hit by gunfire or explosives, but nonetheless, Maria jumped out of the tank multiple times to perform repairs on the battlefield to ensure that the fighting girlfriend could advance. Her skills and bravery during combat received much praise. The battalion commander even thanked the crew of the fighting girlfriend via radio communication, congratulating them on the successful fulfilment of the combat mission. The crew's performance that day later prompted Maria's promotion to the rank of sergeant. A month later, in November of 1943, the Soviet forces captured the town of Novoye Selo in the region of Vitebsk during a night attack. The fighting girlfriend broke through the German lines, but during the battle, the tank was hit by an artillery shell that knocked out its tracks. The inertia of the tank caused it to roll down into a small ravine that luckily hid it from enemy artillery fire. During this time, the Nazis continued to conduct mortar fire at the tank, which prevented any of the crewmen from getting out and performing the needed repairs. Any attempts to pull the tank out of the ravine were also unsuccessful. Several times the Nazis attempted to approach and destroy the tank with grenades, though luckily all of these attempts failed. Despite this, the crew of the fighting girlfriend refused to abandon the vehicle. Instead, the crew continued to fight off enemy attacks with the tank's turret and their own firearms for two whole days, all while attempting repairs during the night. The crew successfully repaired the tank and rejoined the main unit several days later. The battalion's officers praised Maria once more and her legend began to take shape. On the 17th of January, 1944, Maria participated in a night attack against the Germans as part of the Leningrad Novgorod offensive that aimed to break the German siege of the city. The attack took place at the village of Shvedi, near Vitebsk. <laughs> Shvedi. Shvedi balls. During the battle, Maria drove her T-34 around the German defences, destroying resistance in trenches and machine gun nests. The tank crew also destroyed a German self-propelled gun. Their success, however, didn't last very long, as the tank was yet again hit in one of its transmission wheels by an anti-tank shell and was immobilised. Maria, like she'd always done, immediately got out of the tank and began to repair the track. But she was hit in the right eye by shrapnel from a nearby mine explosion, and she lost consciousness. After the battle, Maria was quickly taken to Field Hospital 478, and from there she was airlifted to Fastiv Hospital near Kiev, where they discovered 
that the shrapnel had penetrated through her eye and into her brain, making the wound extremely serious. She went into a coma and remained there for two months while she was visited by her colleagues and commanders, some of whom took it upon themselves to award her the decorations that she had earned, the Order of the Great Patriotic War of the First Degree and the Order of Lenin. Maria continued her fight against her injuries, but sadly she passed away on the 15th of March 1944 in a frontline hospital in Smolensk, and she was later buried at the memory of Heroes Square next to the heroes who fell in defence of Smolensk during the Patriotic War of 1812. On the 2nd of August 1944, Maria was posthumously awarded the title Hero of the Soviet Union. So what happened to the fighting girlfriend? Well, the name has been frequently used in Soviet tanks since then, as the name sort of gets passed on as a legacy from one tank to the other as they get destroyed. And it is known that the fourth tank named Fighting Girlfriend reached the German city of Konisberg, today's Kaliningrad in Russia. At the end of the war, the Guard Tank Regiment adopted the tradition of calling some of its units by the name Fighting Girlfriend. And several streets in former Soviet cities have since been named after Maria and a monument to her was erected on her last battlefield. This is a woman who loved her husband so much that she bought a tank and ultimately sacrificed her own life so she could unleash her wrath upon the men who killed him. You know how the saying goes, hell hath no fury. And that's a hell of a fury. <laughs> it's Count Dankula on YouTube. Everybody subscribe.